Welcome to Funding Portal's webinar on Funding for the Information and Communications Technology, or ICT, sector. Thank you for joining us. My name is Karen Fournier, and I will be your technical moderator today. Please note that your lines will be muted during the call. However, you can type in questions at any time using the Q&A tool. We will also reach out with an email with a copy of the slides after the call today. Pour ceux d'entre vous qui parlent français, la présentation sera en anglais aujourd'hui, mais vous pouvez en tout temps poser des questions dans la langue de votre choix. Joining me for the session today is our special guest, Debbie Weinstein, co-founder and partner at Labarge Weinstein, Canada's business law firm for knowledge-based companies. Debbie is a true leader in Canada's tech and innovation sector, and we're so excited to have her with us today. She has done incredible work as the lead of more than 200 mergers and acquisitions and is a director at Open Text, one of Canada's largest success stories. Also joining us is Funding Portal President and CEO, Terry Kirk. Terry is also a lawyer by background and has recently been recognized as one of Canada's top entrepreneurs for her work building Funding Portal. She is one of Canada's top experts on funding and certainly one of the person's I, opinions I respect the most when it comes to um, raising funds. Today, we're going to be dividing the content into three parts. First, we'll help you to understand the funding landscape for ICT companies. Then we will have a Q&A session with Debbie on how to get ready for funding. In part three, we will discuss how you can move forward to actually secure the money we talked about during the presentation. Finally, in the last 10 minutes, around 12.50, we will end the session with a live Q&A. We will answer any questions you type in using the online interface. Without further ado, Terry, you can proceed with part one. Well, thank you so much. And uh, double check that everyone can hear me. We can hear you, Terry. Go ahead. Wonderful. Okay, well, we're going to start, as Karen says, with understanding this um, complex financial marketplace. And it's fun to see Debbie and I, uh, the pictures in both of our suits. It harkens back to a kinder, gentler era when we all went to offices and so on. So I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm in my Lululemons today, and I'm sure Debbie is too. So um, uh, let's uh, settle in for a good, comfortable uh, lunch and learn session of learning. So we like to think of grants and incentives as a financing marketplace. It's a very large one. Um, I'll give you some numbers on that. It's certainly very diverse. And we like to think that there's really something for everyone. This money goes to those who apply and apply often and apply effectively. Um, it's not all positive. It's a, a complex marketplace to navigate within. Governments don't um, have, uh, have um, establishments on, in, on every street corner like our banks and um, don't always answer their phones or have people to do that. So it is a very complex marketplace to navigate within, uh, both to find the right programs to, and to apply for them. And that's what we're going to do today is talk a bit about how you can... Um, work with firms like ours and, and, and Debbie's to um, navigate and have success in this marketplace. Here's a few metrics. In Canada, the um, Grants and Incentives Financing Marketplace typically sits at about $30 billion a year. I think a low watermark is around $26 billion. It's at an all-time high right now since World War II. It's closer to $40 billion. Um, so a very good time to move forward and apply to as a bit of a comparative landscape in the US. Um, uh, they spend about 180 billion of US dollars um, in our currency, about 240 billion. So, um, you know, roughly speaking, it's that good old fashioned 10x factor where we sit at, let's just call it kind of 25 billion and they're at about 250 billion. Um, so a big honking financing marketplace and we really encourage you to um, apply. Um, let's turn to some of the sample funds. Um, some of them are household names. I think it's really important to remember that we're going to highlight five or six or seven today. Uh, there are about 4,500, so another 4,445 or so of them that we won't be talking about and I think that speaks to the complexity 
and the need for digital tools and solutions to navigate this um, marketplace. Many of you will know SIF, the Strategic Innovation Fund. Its key feature is it's for very large projects and large companies that can fund their share of the project. So it won't be relevant to many on the line, but a good one to know about. Um, the projects uh, it funds need to be kind of 20 million plus. And because um, the average contribution typically is around about a third, then it's um, you know funding very large scale projects of 60 to 120 million plus. Um, typical uh, awards, uh, now sit the average award is about $33 million per project. And um, these projects all are about RD commercialization and growth amount innovation sectors. Um, they do actually write a lot of checks and there have been 69 projects announced um, to date. So an exciting one for the big giants uh, on the line. Um, turning to a little smaller program, there's business scale up and productivity. Uh, we call it the BSUP, of course. It's a growth oriented fund. Um, so not focused on R&D, but rather on your growth stage in your, in your um, uh, corporate life cycle. These are repayable contributions. That's important. Um, Debbie's going to talk to you a bit about debt and equity, which are the tools that the private sector uses to flow money to companies and governments they tend to use um, grants and tax credits. Within the grants uh, world, um, repayable contributions is a bit of a hybrid. It's, it's a bit, technically, it's a dead instrument because one has to um, repay. On the other hand, it's much more favorable than classic debt. Um, differences with debt are typically you don't um, have to pay any interest, which is the case with the, uh, the BSUP. It's interest free. Secondly, repayments of principles don't start until a project is largely done or significant milestones have been achieved. So it may be kind of effectively a grant for a good three years or so. Uh, the repayment obligations are often conditional on success being achieved. So you don't end up, up with a big debt if, if the project outcomes haven't been determined. Um, you know, that's kind of all in the fine print, but good to understand that it is money that's kind of flowed to you, to, um, but does have some repayment terms associated with it. Uh, let's turn to another fund then, the SME Technology Development Program, again, per its name. And these names sound complex, but they are very helpful. Each word does end up being very important. It tells you that this program is for SMEs, and it's all about tech dev, um, unlike the last program we talked about, which was about funding your growth. So this is for funding funding tech dev um, being uh, done by SMEs and um, this particular program is administered by Encore. Encore um, is really an outsourced organization, a, a group of companies that the government has chosen to administer um, a program. Happily, none of the kind of controversy around the, uh, around the uh, WE uh, administration of a particular charitable program uh, has um, flowed to Encore. It was a very fair, uh, open process for choosing Encore as a group of excellent companies with proven track records and um, uh, seen to be able to make excellent decisions on behalf of government to get our 5G um, sector um, moving and catching up with other international jurisdictions. So this is for Ontario-based SMEs. That'll be disappointing for those who aren't um, fit into that category. It, um, is more directive. Um, it's really uh, bid oriented. So um, Encore calls them it challenge based and it sets out certain challenges that our country needs to meet in order to be competitive in 5G and invites companies to respond. So it's almost more like an RFP or competitive bid process than a typical grant application. The awards are, um, you know, small ish um, designed to help lots of companies uh, participate bring forward smaller projects so the awards level is kind of 50k to 500k 
Um, one more, let's look at two more actually. We'll talk about the NGEN demonstration program. NGEN, some of you will know as um, one of the super clusters, the five uh, super clusters that competed and won the right to uh, distribute money within a discrete region and um, sector. So NGEN is the advanced uh, uh, manufacturing super cluster. It's uh, here in Ontario and came up with a creative name, Engine, as the engine of the economy, and again, flowing funding to Ontario-based um, SMEs in the advanced manufacturing sector. Their uh, projects that they're focused on are proof of concept and, uh, and demonstration projects, and these are smaller awards at the 50K level. Let's look at uh, can export then. We've covered off kind of projects for specific sectors like 5G and advanced uh, manufacturing. We looked at projects that are more generically uh, for any sector but focus on either growth and R&D and this one focuses uh, on exporters uh, across any sector. Um, um, subject to some conditions, I might say, but um, the grants are 15k to 75k per project. They fund up to 75% of eligible costs. This is highly unusual that you can get three quarters of your costs uh, funded through government. So fabulous program means that you can, you know, bring forward a hundred thousand dollar project and get seventy-five thousand uh, dollars cover. It's specifically to encourage companies to enter new international national markets is an important value in itself, but it's also seen to be what's um, critical to just achieving growth overall. Companies that can enter a new international market and get beyond their domestic borders are those that tend to scale and, and do very well. It's also um, a pretty fast project uh, program and you get your approvals within six business days. Um, people often complain that governments are slow and often governments are slow. But we find in the area of financing and grants and incentives are actually really quite fast and compare very favorably to private sector. For those of you who have tried to raise capital, and Debbie will tell us more about that, you know, 60 days would be a pretty fast turnaround time to get from ask to closing and certainly with bank financing as well. So good, fast, uh, cheap and cheerful program for those who are uh, entering uh, new markets. Let's turn then, um, I've given you five or six examples of programs and uh, that range and demonstrate the diversity of the financial marketplace by size, sector, region, activity set of the company. It's equally important to understand matching funds. Government incentives are not designed to fund companies per se. They're designed to incent um, companies to move forward with projects that they couldn't otherwise fund and basically ready themselves for private financing markets which will support them in their later stage growth um, activities. So, um, you know, the main sources of, of uh, matching funds are, of course, your own revenues. And maybe I'll take a moment and elaborate on what I mean by matching funds. So if a government's willing to fund a third, and we've seen as much as 75%, it means that two-thirds or a quarter or so has to come from other sources. And generally, the company will want to be able to reach into Treasury or its own revenues and not have to secure additional financing in order to contribute the matching funds. Um, uh, on the other hand, in very large projects, it's not unusual to say we're going forward with, let's just call it a, uh, a $5 million project. We're going to seek a third from government. We're going to try and put in a third ourselves, and we're going to look to the private sector to help fund a third as well. And there you're going to be typically looking for, as we talked about, equity or debt. Um, you know, the challenges with those is equity is about dilution and debt has a repayable obligation. Um, happily, you know, I think we have quite robust uh, private sector marketplaces in Canada. Uh, Debbie will tell us a bit more. Uh, you know um, where those sources are and on Funding Portal we, um, our tools as we'll talk about, help you not only to source government money but sources of debt and equity as well to find and apply for these um, sources. So that's just a quick introduction to the world of matching funds and the need to have matching funds either within your own company or to look to private sector sources to um, 
uh, provide the other portion that governments aren't funding. Let's turn now to part two, and I think we're kind of right on time to, uh, to um, start a discussion with uh, Debbie. We're calling this part two, Get Ready for Funding. And just a quick introduction to LW Law. Debbie will be too modest to tell you herself, I'm sure. It was founded in 1997, so bringing kind of 23 years of, uh, of really specialized experience working with our highest growth companies and uh, early stage tech companies has just provided just such an incredible um, service in our innovation economy and congratulations to Debbie and her partner Paul Labarge in founding that at a time that the law firms really weren't well equipped to um, help startups who didn't have um, typical ways to pay law firms. Um, it helps companies from startup to, ex to exit and uh, the Globe and Mail reported in 2015 that it is Canada's most active law firm in VC deals. So with no further ado, I'm going to um, uh, to really ask Debbie a series of questions and, and we know they're the very questions on your mind and she will bring her deep expertise to her answer. So Debbie, let's start with, you know, what is the role of a law firm and your law firm, LW Law in particular, to helping clients with their fundraising and capital markets activities? Thanks, Terry, and hello, everyone. And, and by the way, just continuing the Canadian theme of Terry wearing Lululemon, I'm wearing Art Direct. So supporting, <laughs> supporting great Canadian uh, 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 retail and apparel business, and hopefully they will succeed and continue to su succeed for a long time. So thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, as noted, we do help from startup to exit. Um, on, on your slides now, you'll see some of the things that we help um, young new entrepreneurs or repeat entrepreneurs, serial entrepreneurs with, um, with respect to their companies, whether it's understanding how founders come together and protect each other, uh, as well as a myriad of shareholders and financings, and we'll get into all of that, but let me, in a bit. Let me, let me focus on, on the question at hand. I think um, Terry and Terry's company does an excellent job of providing um, companies of all sizes with the opportunity for government grants and funding. This complements, as Terry says, um, what has to be done with just a lot of grit work. And you must start early. Um, when you're looking for funding, whether it's through some of the vehicles that Terry's mentioned, or some of the vehicles that are very standard to startups like IRAP, um, BD, BDC debt money. It's very important to start very early with your plans of how you're going to raise money. It's no different for those of you that are knowledge-based companies in having a plan around your technology build. So just as you have a strategy of what your technology build will be, you really need a strategy of how your financing will uh, assist you in pursuing that. And that's where a firm like ours um, can come in and assist you from a strategic point of view in making sure that you understand the traction you need to have, the kind of team you need to equip yourself with if you're a sole founder, uh, as well as the steps you need to take to get that early money, to, to, to get the money right after the sweat equity, and to really map out uh, your future uh, just as you're mapping out your product and platform future. Um, so, so it really is a question of, of early. There's, there's, as I said, government money, um, not only the ones that Terry's elaborated on, but much others. There's angel money, and that really can come about and is best to come about through your own networks and the networks you garner through meeting different advisors. So Labarge Weinstein does not raise money for you. We don't, uh, we're not, that's not our business, nor do we make a lot of introductions. But what we do do is try to work with you to try to map out um, how to go about it. So regardless of the of the industry you're in we ask you to really focus on the platform and the the both the macro and micro um area that you're in so so let me let me give a let me give a really quick example if you're looking for 
angels, that's going to have to be through your network, through your advisor's network, through your accountants, your lawyers, your, your other advisors, your board members, your own network, your own Rolodex. But once you start to get that uh, angel money, you then have to start to prepare for A rounds and larger rounds of equity with, with uh, venture capitalists and other uh, smart money. And these days, and really for the last decade, it's not just VCs. VCs come in a myriad of, 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 of looks. Um, there are strategic investors. So many of the large companies in your area typically may have uh, venture funds or funds set aside. We saw, for example, Shopify just the other, just today, uh, yesterday rather, had an announcement around dozens of investments and commitments they're making to their carbon footprint and their neutral carbon footprint. And one of our clients here in Ottawa was lucky enough to be one of their first um, uh, suppliers of that. So I always say focus very much on the players that are both directly your competitors and indirectly within your ecosystem. Start to watch and make sure you're tracking their press releases. Look at who their investors are. Look at who your direct and indirect competitors investors are. And then continue to layer up the industry. Look at the bigger players in your industry. If you're a platform or a SaaS technology, look at the platform that you compete in and start to track the complementary businesses that are also gaining traction so that you can identify the investors and ultimately the potential acquirers if, if exit is something that's on your, on your map. So very important to understand your ecosystem and be tracking just as you do the competitive nature of your technology and the competitive nature of your people power with what's going on um, with respect to uh, the, fi the financing and, and investments going on. Um, Terry, I'll stop there on that question, but I did see a question uh, or on that answer, but I just saw a question around reverse vesting, which I'm happy to talk about uh, very briefly if you'd like. I think that's wonderful. Yeah, what a great okay. question. All right. So to the to the uh, to those in the audience that are um, new founders or wannabe founders or entrepreneurs to business, um, to the extent you have co-founders with you, to the extent you're you're going to own your own business at the outset, one hundred percent, and you're not bringing together a team, then this concept of reverse vesting does not apply. But um, you know, keep in mind when you incorporate a company, there is a difference between the percentage you own and the number of shares. So people often focus on, well, I'm going to own a million shares. That's going to be worth a lot of money. The more important thing to focus on is the percentage that you're going to ultimately own. And I'm going through this with a startup right now where I have three founders and then I have a couple of people who've been helping them. And then we've already got two uh, angel groups, one from Canada and one from another country. And I'm the, these uh, founders are going to be, are coming from a very large organization. They're in their forties, but have never run their own company. So we're really starting at first principles. And so if I just use that example, I could give each of them, let's just start with three founders, a million shares each, and they would own a third of the company. But, and, and I won't even get into the angel investors and the quote near founders for a minute, but what happens if one of them either passes away or comes into a huge inheritance in the next year? These three individuals have a lot of work. They each have their areas of focus that they're going to be leaving their old company and starting a new one. And what I need to protect all the founders from is uh, hopefully an event that doesn't happen, but should it happen, puts the remaining shares back in the other invest in the founders hands. And so let's just assume we have three founders and one dies a year from now, but they had committed to work with sweat equity. So either very little salary when they raise some angel money or no salary at all at the beginning and work hard on this project for three years. So you can imagine if one of them is no longer able or around or chooses to leave, then, then that person, if I don't have a reverse vesting or a clawback of some of those shares, 
will walk away from the business or, or, or may have to not be part of the business and, but will keep all of the shares when what I really need to have done at the beginning is protect the remaining founders so that we can take back some of the shares that weren't owned or weren't vested. Let's say it's over a three year period and we vest it monthly. So over 36 months, they would sort of own unconditionally the shares. But if someone, let's say, passes away at the end of one year or just walks away because it isn't cut out, they aren't cut out for it, then if they walk out after one year and there's a three year reverse vesting, they would keep one third of their shares and the other two thirds of their shares could either go back into the company, so it reduces the number of shares outstanding, or could go to the remaining founders, the two that are left, or more likely some of them will be used to um, uh, retain another senior person to work in the area that has been lost by the absence of that third founder. That's a, a really helpful, Debbie. Thank you so much for taking that applied example, which I'm sure comes up so often. People are humans in the end, and these things do arise. I think you've given people a really excellent overview of the types of financing, the kinds of situations that arise and require flexibility and important you know, clauses uh, that anticipate these issues. Let's move to um, the IP protection issue and, and how important is that in relation to um, the kinds of um, yeah, documents you prepare for clients. Okay, and I see that David Long from Sage T just provided a very interesting comment that said this came up at, for Sage T and saved us a big issue. So thank you, David, for that. <laughs> um, all right, so an IP protection, you know, even if you're, uh, again, a startup um, working out of your basement at night, there are certain things that are absolutely critical to protect. So the first thing that's most important is um, even if you don't incorporate a company at the beginning, but you're using, um, you're, you're developing an idea, please make sure that you have a standard confidentiality or non-disclosure agreement that you get everyone to sign. That's whether you're pre-incorporation or after incorporation. And keep those in an electronic filing system so that come time for diligence around fundraising or mergers and acquisitions, you're able to show all the non-disclosure and confidentiality because buyers want to make sure that you have, buyers and financers, want to make sure that you have protected your intellectual property. And that isn't just patents. Most companies never file patents. Patents, I won't discuss today, um, are critical processes, but many, many companies worth billions of dollars, well, maybe not billions, but worth lots of money, do not have patents. Do not think that you can't have a company worth tens of millions of dollars without patents, you can. But everything else, um, know-how, copyright, ideas, those are all intellectual property and they need to be protected. So confidentiality and non-disclosure agreements are critical when raising money and when forming and evolving your business. Likewise, you know, we all can, you can put up a, a Shopify website, you can build your own website. Um, when you start your business and you have an online presence, you have to make sure that your terms of use as you know, you, you all know about these terms of use. Anytime you download an app or buy something online um, with an app uh, or accept the terms, whether it's Spotify or anything else, you're accepting the terms of use. And every company needs this because this is, these are the terms under which you can reuse data and protect the IP of not only yourself, but um, the privacy of others. And I didn't, I didn't, I should have put a bullet around privacy. Privacy is another essential, especially if you're in the B2, B2C business to consumer business um, and, and gathering and garnering um, uh, uh, information and data around privacy. Um, there are um, uh, very different and distinct uh, laws that need to be followed, whether in Europe, in Canada, or the US. And again, a, a good law firm that is knowledgeable and working with knowledge-based companies will have a group of lawyers 
who can help you with those policies. And then of course, um, in addition to your name and, and your URL, uh, trademarking logos can be, uh, logos and names can be very important. And of course, all the protection around contracting. And so really every step of your business, whether you're a dominant knowledge-based company or just use technology as a uh, back office or support or in the execution of your services, um, you need to be very wary of and ensure you're protecting your IP. Well, Debbie, I'm going to uh, give you the last word here too. Um, in your 23 years working with Canadian companies in such a close and proximate way, you've been sort of sister, aunt, uh, caregiver, <laughs> Uh, den mother, all of those things. Um, what would you say is, you know, the biggest lesson learned? Give us a two-minute answer on, you know, what will, key word of wisdom you'd pass on to an innovation company? I think like most businesses, the caliber of your team drives the traction of your technology and drives the focus on execution. So for those that are in uh, like in our SMEs, uh, small medium enterprises, you can usually judge um, the success through the team. And I say that because the traction around your technology uh, pivots and moves and, you know, I, I can't tell you how many companies started at producing one thing. I mean, look, look at Amazon, you know, they were in the, in the book selling business, but there was a greater vision. So having the resiliency, and I, that's a, not an overused term because of COVID, but definitely a, a term that we all use a lot, but having the re resiliency and strategic focus to continually pivot your offering and your solution. And so, it may be your solution is right, but are you going after, are you trying to, for example, replace the solution that is out there or move into a market that has, doesn't even exist? And so having the team, the vision, the strategy, and the continual ability to be resilient and pivot and, and, and what I like to call leapfrog, and then starting early with that vision is to me the key. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much, Debbie. And I think it's a real privilege to hear from somebody who brings your level of experience and insight. And thank you so, so much for your time. I'm going to um, move us forward to part three. Debbie and I are both very practical business advisors. We've tried to give you a bit of a kind of high level framework and overview of the world of um, grants and incentives and private financing. And now um, we're going to turn to some, you know, really practical tips around how your company can move forward. At Funding Portal, we organize this process around three broad steps. And we use plain language. Our goal is to demystify and make this world easier, not more complex to, to succeed in. So we call our first step, find it. We just say that any company wants to get from, gosh, I sure would like money for my company into, hey, I, I got funded, uh, which is the dream probably of everybody on the line. Um, you need to move through these three steps. You need to find the best source of capital for your company at this stage of its growth. You need to go through some kind of transaction to secure it and then you need to leverage it into more money. Let's talk about you know how we work with companies like yours and and Debbie's firm does too to make sure you succeed along those three steps. So let's start with find it. Seems intuitive, but I've mentioned that on the government grants and incentive side alone, there are 4,500 programs in our country alone. In the U.S., there are about 11,000 programs. I sometimes compare it to trying to find a hotel in New York. <laughs> there are just lots and lots and lots of choices. It depends on you know so many variables around your budget and your location and... Um, 
so many different factors. So uh, Fund Search is a tool that we have developed. It's a proprietary tool. It's a classic, and I, I say it's, uh, I use the hotel analogy on purpose because it's a bit like the kind of tools we use to find uh, important values like uh, hotels.com or realtor.ca or Expedia. We call it Fund Search and allows you in really about two seconds to enter the information uh, about your company and the types of funding you're looking for and it uses AI, artificial intelligence or smart algorithms to match you to sort through those thousands and thousands and thousands of programs and about 30 data points about each program to match it against your criteria and now we're into under a second to uh, find the right programs and rank them against your objectives. Uh, this is a self-serve tool. It's posted on our website. It used to be free, but we've recently, <laughs> it's a lot for us to maintain it in French and English and up to date. It's about a million data points a day that we keep up to date in both languages to provide this tool. So we now have a, a, a very small uh, fee. You can subscribe. We'll talk a bit more about that, but it's a few bucks basically and you can use the tool and it's a great starting point. You'll see it has both public sector funds and private sector so you can navigate through the 4,500 kind of grants and incentive programs. Um, we provide the top 10. I often say it's like finding a flight. It's great to know that there are 300 different flight options but you really want to know about kind of the top two or three choices for you. And so our fund search tool does that for you. It also then um, includes 1,500 sources of private financing and anything from angels and VCs to bank financing and capital markets and lenders and accredited investors and so on. So um, we're really excited about that tool. It's our primary um, proprietary tool. It's very popular. It's been uh, in operation for about seven years now and we've literally had hundreds and hundreds of thousands of companies use the tool. Um, yeah, it actually shows you your top 20 results and there's a, a bit of an image of, um, sorry about that, um, and it, it includes an image of um, of, of, of the way that the results are organized for you. We call each one of these a fund card and in a second you will see the name of the program that's right for you or the funder. Um, you can click through and view the funder's website. You can get all the details you need about um, how much money you can get. Is it debt? Is it equity? Is it a tax credit? Uh, what is it? Um, and even find a link for applying to the program. So we encourage you to subscribe and uh, use fund search. At uh, the other end of the spectrum, some companies don't want to use a cheap and cheerful self-help tool. They're looking for more hands-on, sophisticated advice, and we do um, a comprehensive workup for you. We call it a funding sources report, and there, um, you know, we'll add it's 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 a much more detailed kind of report where we've gotten to know your company better. We've really leveraged our people who use the tool all day, every day. Um, we identify the awards history of the particular programs. This is very important predictive intelligence around what your company is likely to get. So we answer not only what are the best programs, but how much could you expect to get if you were to move forward with an application into a particular program or funder. Um, so our reports are also very popular. We've done thousands of them for uh, many diverse companies. Again, um, kind of startups right up to global companies who are looking at investing and growing their businesses in Canada. Um, step, step two then, having identified the top programs, whether through a self-help tool or a comprehensive report, you now need to move forward, having made some decisions about which ones you're going to invest in. Um, and, and to, in the case of grants, it's generally speaking a grant application. In the case of um, other types of financing, it's sometimes a term sheet, um, it's a pitch deck, etc. So um, at Funding Portal and off and we work with uh, Debbie on her expertise when we're into capital markets for companies. Um, 
we carry out that step on behalf of our clients too. We're very proud that in the grants and incentives marketplace, we've achieved a 94% success rate. This is much higher than companies do on their own. Uh, we don't pretend to be wizards. We just leverage data and analytics and software to really help you uh, be successful. Using the fund search tool in our database has a massive impact on your outcome. Companies can write brilliant applications and apply to the wrong fund. Often in seconds, we could have told them that notwithstanding the language on the funder's website, it really would not be a good fit for them by looking at the awards history and other factors that uh, we know um, through deep interactions with, with these funders. Uh, we turn around our grant applications in 15 business days really fast. For those of you who have labored over your summer holidays, uh, trying to write a winning grant application, it's fast. We have a team that that's all they do for a living. Um, many of them are drawn from the government funding programs and they just know how to do this really, really well. Uh, we have flat rates. We have an understand that companies who are looking to get funding are very uh, conscious about how they spend their dollars and are often reaching into their own personal pocketbooks to fund it. Um, so you'll see that we have been able to bring forward really um, low cost uh, rates for moving forward with this, um, what is a very time consuming and complex step in the process. Our third step then is leverage it. Um, this really uh, ex uh, accepts the principle that um, feeding the beast is not something that you do once. It's, uh, it's the uh, lifeblood of any company to apply for funding. So companies are doing it continuously. Sometimes you'll take a pause and put some money to work. But generally speaking, if you've uh, succeeded with a grant, you're looking for a bigger one, you're leveraging it into capital markets and so on. Um, so we have our three subscription services. Uh, one is uh, aimed at our largest clients, our enterprise clients, which we describe as 100 plus employees in Canada, which is a fairly large company. Our SMEs, which are 10 to 100 employees in our startups. And we're really pleased to have kind of curated our tools and data and services for each of these three types of organizations. Um, to subscribe. It's kind of 100 a month for a large company and for startups it's $30 a month and um, you'll see that then you get a curated set of um, uh, of a report on the right funding for you as a startup organization. We keep you informed about what's out there. This is the biggest concern of organizations that they're going to miss the launch of a new fund. Um, not understand that it's got a new September 15th launch date, for example, or a call for proposals. It is really impossible for any organization without software, in my opinion, to stay on top of all these programs and the changes and um, and certainly the COVID environment. We welcome the new programs there, but it's added to the complexity uh, on staying on top of just those programs alone. Uh, let me tell you a bit about with our subscription service, apart from having then free access to the fund search tool, which you can then use 24 seven whenever you want on your mobile phone or your desktop. Um, you know, companies really love our alert service. It's real time. So as funders, announce new programs or new dates or new calls or amended terms, um, we push that out to you, uh, to your email or your text, uh, just to, so you know uh, before any of your competitors know, you'll understand when awards are being made in your sector. So if you're clean tech, um, ICT clean tech, then you're going to be very interested in understanding what your competitors are doing, the awards they're getting, and the new programs that come up. So um, fabulous program for $30 a month, um, bundled with our other services. I think it's um, critical in, in, for companies who are serious about being uh, successful applicants in this marketplace. Let me give you um, a case study and a bit of advice and then we'll touch base on what's happening in the COVID world and open things up to questions. So, uh, you know, case study, I'm going to reference Balin. It's a really successful little fun company. Um, not so little. It's an enterprise company. It's um, Balin Technologies. It's a satellite telephony company. It was in Israel, decided to move to Canada 
very exciting for us as Canadians, and uh, IPO'd on TMX and um, moved forward, as Debbie says, with the strategic plan for raising capital and um, pursuing grants and incentives in the Canadian financing marketplace. So um, we worked with it through our three steps, uh, doing a comprehensive workup for it, allowing it access to our free tool so they can use it whenever they have questions about different projects and whether they might get funding for it. Um, we identified key programs for it, uh, which included, in their case, they had a SIF level uh, project, uh, also a candidate for business scale up and uh, productivity program. So I think it's a great example of a company deciding to deploy a, a fundraising strategy, understand the grants and incentives, sign up for our search tool, a comprehensive report, and receive alerts. So um, they're the first to know when there's a new program that's right for them or one of their competitors are getting a significant award. I'd, I'd like to take a moment and just as Debbie summarized her kind of top advice for those on the line, um, you know, I think our learning in working now with companies over eight years to have success in this financing marketplace is that the biggest kind of risks are eligibility and compliance. So um, we see particularly with startups and SMEs, uh, all of us as entrepreneurs tend to take a very positive view of the world and our company and our success and governments tend to be sticklers for detail and um, it's quite common for companies to kind of read uh, the eligibility criteria with um, all the positivity that they bring to things and maybe overlook some of the fine print. Um, we've often seen that companies maybe spend a lot of time and resources applying to something where you needed to have five to ten employees let's say and they had eleven and that is enough to become ineligible for a program. I think entrepreneurs have trouble believing that anyone would really throw their application in the garbage pail for over such a minor discrepancy but the fact is the rules are the rules and um, this is an area of um, uh, well, let's just say it's an area where we work really hard in ensuring that our clients um, do uh, comply and that's a big factor in our success factor. Um, I think the second area where companies have difficulty in this marketplace is um, they tend to speak in their own language and forget that you're really speaking to um, an audience, government funders who are really very different than we are as entrepreneurs. Um, you know, that they really are guided by their fund criteria and they apply the rules very rigorously and they want to hear language that they understand and they're not necessarily experts in the same things that you are or understand your industry jargon and your acronyms and so on. So um, that's one of our focuses is to really write for government funding uh, decision makers as opposed to um, writing for your team. And I think the last point is to really understand that these decisions are binary. Um, they're not a kind of, wow, this looks great, but you forgot to answer that, or we found this answer weak, and we're giving you a second kick at the can. Some programs are much more flexible. IRAP that Debbie mentioned uh, does bring that through its ITA uh, process, but this is highly exceptional. Generally, you nailed it, and you get 100% of the compliance and you answered all the questions really well and you win or you lose. There really isn't a chance to modify. We've developed a tool to address that. We call it Scorecard and um, we write uh, applications for our clients but then we take it through an arm's length scorecard process for people who didn't write the application and and aren't within the company, um, score it and you set up a digital scorecard that matches the government's specific criteria for that particular program. Let's say some require that you're exporting and will give you 10 points and couldn't care less whether you're exporting. And um, in that way, your application will score 100% uh, before it leaves funding portals offices and is recommended for submitting into uh, the funder. So those are some of the traps that companies run into and some of the ways that we try and help them through it. Um, we wouldn't have done our job today unless we talked about the pandemic and the important role that governments are playing in helping your company through it. Uh, I think we can all feel proud to be Canadians and to have the support we've um, had, not to say, though that it's been a particularly difficult time for 
early stage innovation uh, companies and I think, uh, you know, a bit of a broad consensus that this is an area that didn't get as much support uh, through the programs as, as some other areas. Uh, just a bit of an update, Q's, you know, uh, has been extended to November 21st and there's some talk that it'll be uh, extended further through to December 31st. So throne speech is coming up and we expect some clear answers to that question, but it's being extended. Uh, the SEBA program, the loan program is also being extended through to October 31st and the BCAP loan program is being extended right through to next June. Um, so that's where we're at on the key programs that so many of you will um, know and hopefully be taking advantage of at this time. I'd like to raise one more question with you and then we're right on time at 12.50 uh, to allow 10 minutes for Q&A. Um, SAS uh, Funding Portal has built its proprietary tools. We've mentioned a few of them are really innovative a fund search tool which is a bit like realtor.ca or hotels.com that you can use to source funding. Um, our digital scorecard tool that plays a huge role in improving your outcomes and applying for grants and incentives. Um, and we use those to fund our own service but um, we can't meet the uh, entire innovation marketplace. We know that there are large accounting firms and other uh, firms that, and firms like Debbie's who work so well with um, a variety of clients that we won't uh, secure as clients ourselves. And so we have developed SaaS and this is um, uh, where we are powering um, other advisory firms so that they can use our digital tools and solutions to help you as well. A number of our larger clients who do a lot of applications for grants and incentives and are constantly kind of searching for funding also use our SaaS solution. So instead of needing to come to us and us to use them to deliver our service, you may prefer to insource these tools and data so that you can use them yourself. It's, uh, you know, if you're a... Um, Micro company that's looking for funding once or twice in a year, you don't need desktop tools, you need a great advisor. For larger companies with in-house teams who want to be kind of searching for funding all the time for various projects, they will want these desktop tools and we can SAS and license them to you. Um, so please keep that in mind. Here's a quick contact slide um, with both Debbie's and my own uh, emails. And of course, we're supported, both of us, by large teams. And you can reach out on our website. So I hope that's of help. And now we're going to turn to some questions and answers and get Karen, our wonderful Karen Fournier, to lead us through uh, your questions. Thank you, Terry. Um, so we already received a lot of questions uh, via the online chat interface, which have been answered, but I also received some emails from some participants via email. So I'm going to address some of those. Um, Terry, the first question is for you. What impact do you think COVID will have on the government's grant budget in the coming years? Yeah, well, it certainly had a huge impact. We've uh, tracked grants and incentives since World War II. And, um, uh, you know, they're at their high, we're at their highest in the pre-COVID and then have had a massive bump, more than 20% increase in the amount of grants and incentives available to companies in Canada at this time as a result of the pandemic. Um, I mean, uh, we would expect that uh, these programs aren't going to become part of the permanent landscape. Uh, they weren't designed to. They are designed as emergency funds to get all of us through a crisis. Uh, so they will dissipate. On the other hand, um, you know, it's really interesting to see in a kind of 70 year history since World War II, governments really, this funding has gone up every single year. It never goes down. So we expect that trend to continue. They'll probably normalize back at around 26 to 30 billion dollars but um, I think uh, you know the pand with the pandemic our uh, our um, economy is not going to recover overnight it will re need additional support for a number of years and so we do expect um, overall growth in the level of grants and incentives for uh, probably about a five-year period yeah thanks Karen thank you Terry that's a great answer um, so Debbie, the next question is for you. You've worked with so many companies. Have you seen any that had really great strategies to stand out from other companies trying to do their fundraising activities? Uh, for their fundraising activities. Um... Or you could uh, approach it maybe from the IP ang uh, angle or the tech angle, if that's easier. Yeah. Um... <laughs> 
um, tr well, tra traction, uh, uh, okay, so um, I would say the best strategy, so, so the clients of mine that raise money on literally a snap of a finger are entrepreneurs that have already had exits. So I've got, I've got probably four or five, maybe half a dozen entrepreneurs that are on their third or fourth company. And, you know, I can project that they can raise five to 10 to $15 million in the first few years uh, without any problem because their angels come in right away. Um, their, um, the, the supporting organizations like BDC come in, um, the grant money comes in, they're very shrewd around that, and then the VCs come in. So my, my advice for those of you that aren't serial entrepreneurs or have not had an exit yet is to, when I go, when I go back to building the right team, it's how can you find the right team members that can assist you? And I'll, I'll give you a very, very quick example, uh, one that won't breach any confidentiality. A uh, wonderful CEO in Ottawa where I practice is a fellow called Mike Wider. He had two tech companies uh, 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 that were uh, Watchfire sold to IBM and Blaze sold to Akamai, both software security uh, companies, both very tech focused. He then was looking for his next uh, gig and decided he wanted to do something a little different. And, and uh, through uh, an intro met a ear, nose and throat uh, pediatric specialist um, here in, in Ottawa, Matt Bromwich, who together with three other doctors had come up with and invented a number of very cool um, products for uh, those, um, for, for the ear, nose and throat area. Um, many products, but one in particular looked like it had some some uh, traction, early traction. They were they you know they were literally doing this at night and on weekends, and it was doctors. So I don't need to say more about that. And Mike agreed to join them, uh, and they were fledgling. I would say you know they had been together for five years, and maybe they were generating several hundred thousand dollars of revenue. Uh, long story short, Mike joined a CEO and I call it near founder, uh, a bunch of us, because I'm part of a fund that Mike's part of. We put a bunch of angel money in. And before we knew it, he had the same investors that he had in the prior companies. But this time he also found grant money uh, because of the nature of the product they really focused on. It was an eye test that could be done remotely, but with uh, uh, not an eye test, sorry, a hearing test audiology that could be done remotely with iPads, which Matt had originally designed for work in the North. Um, and Mike really got into with his team, who he brought on, what this market is all about. And three or four years after he started it, we sold the company to one of the largest private equity companies in the world focused on the hearing aid business because what um, Clearwater, the company that I'm talking about, did uh, was an early warning signal for those that would need hearing aids later on, later on in their life. And so this was really a precursor technology that um, the, the private equity firm was rolling up around hearing tests generally in the hearing, hearing industry. And now you probably don't notice it, but I notice there's always now commercials for hearing aid. You're going to find more and more um, simple hearing aid tests online at, uh, and at, at, uh, at pharmacies, etc. And Clearwater is a great example of that. And I, I you know, without uh, being negative on Matt and the other doctor founders, because they're brilliant at what they do, there is no question in my mind the company would not have either grown or had the kind of exit it had in the time it had without bringing Mike on. So, you know, that, that to me is a, a really great um, example of how to, how to become successful. Great story. Love it. Great, Karen. Any, uh, any final questions that we want to cover off? I think we have time for one last question for you, Terry. There were quite a few people asking about, um, U.S. companies moving to Canada and whether we could work with them. So maybe you can talk about how we work with companies on both sides of the borders and those moving between the two jurisdictions. 
Yeah, I think that's an excellent question that we haven't covered yet around kind of the international environment for companies and and the flow of funding. Um, it really uh, unfolds in three ways. Um, one is for Canadian companies that are looking to um, expand into the U.S. and um, entitled to ask, you know, are there any U.S. grants and incentives for my company? And um, you know, the answer is it depends. Uh, grants and incentives is, uh, is outside of the foreign trade and fairness kind of rules and platform. It's money that countries are allowed to invest um, and, and have a bias in favor of their own, um, their own uh, domestic companies. So generally, if you're just a Canadian company and you want to start selling into the U.S., you will not get a U.S.-based grants and incentive. If, on the other hand, you decide you want to open up a California office and start doing some manufacturing and some hiring there, you would definitely be eligible for California state-based as well as federal um, grants and incentives across the border. So we do work with uh, 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 many, many, I'd say probably 30% of our uh, Canadian companies are interested in understanding uh, the U.S. grants and incentives. Self and forward thinking, they haven't done it. They want to understand, gosh, would there be grants and incentives available if I were to carry out this activity, uh, typically in the U.S., but sometimes in, in other countries as well. Um, also, then we do run our service in the U.S. and the U.K. for companies located in those jurisdictions in the same way we do in Canada. And I think the third point is around foreign-based companies wanting to come to Canada. We've done quite a bit. We just worked for a, a Korean giant wanting to explore uh, opportunities here. And, of course, grants and incentives are designed to not only help domestic companies but get foreign companies to, to create jobs and bring their activity sets to Canada. So, um uh, we do do uh, a lot of work for foreign companies to exploring our um, incentives landscape here. So, um, yeah, I guess we're at one o'clock. And um, thank you so much, Debbie, for joining us. I loved uh, your examples and your uh, deep experience in this market. Hopefully people learned a bit uh, about grants and incentives. And Karen, thank you for steering us through it. And uh, we look forward to hearing any of you who want to hear more from us. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So I'm going to be ending the meeting now. As promised, you'll receive a copy of the slides and a video recording uh, by tomorrow end of day. Thank you, everybody. Take care.